Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Charbonneau. I'm the associate publisher for Spin Sheet Magazine. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. Um, before we get started, I everyone knows my job. I got to thank our sponsor, uh, Mount Gay Rum. Uh, fantastic people. So glad that they're continuing to help us do this show. It's a lot of fun, and uh, we appreciate their support. Uh, and of course, we appreciate you tuning in, because if you weren't tuning in, they wouldn't sponsor it. So uh, just on that note, uh, if you didn't know it, we're 100% uh, advertiser supported. You don't you pick up our magazines and come to our websites absolutely free. We don't charge you for any of it. Um, so without those advertisers, we can't do it. So we really strongly encourage you to uh, to support our advertisers and let them know your fans. And that way we can continue to do this and all live happily together. Um, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Molly Winans. Hey, Hi, Char. Molly. Happy, uh, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy yeah. Friday. It's springtime. It's Friday. And it turned it, into it, a nice day. I don't know what it's like in other parts of the Bay, but after a, a dreary, blustery morning, it's just sunny and beautiful and continually we, blustery, but nice, you know? Yes. I tried. I had, I had lunch with a friend or a couple of friends today, this, this afternoon, and we dared to try and sit outside and it didn't quite work out, yeah. um, but it did turn into a nice day. So, yay. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, this, uh, people love to say, I've noticed no matter, it seems like no matter where you are, they love to say about spring, something like, you know, give it a minute, the weather will change. And yeah. so I think it's, it's not just around here that that happens because they seem to say it everywhere I have ever gone. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we've had some highs and lows. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, tornado was, warnings and all sorts of crazy things. You know? I think we saw flurries on Sunday. It was crazy. But yeah, I did too. I did too. So I, anyway, I think we're turning a corner into April though. I know we keep saying it, but it's April. So I think we are turning the corner and I'm very psyched. And, uh, you know, it's been a nice winter and I'm ready to, uh, I was just, just asking someone today, what's the water temperature? Because last time I checked, it was about 48 degrees. Mm. I like when it goes into the 50s, you know, when I feel like I can put on a wetsuit and go paddle boarding. I have a dry suit, not that keen on it just because the, the, you know, the, the claustrophobia factor is high there. But I'm ready to get on the water. But, you know, yeah. in the meantime, it's Friday night and um, I'm just over here having a cocktail. Ooh. Well, before you reveal that, do you want to bring our guest on and we can all do a cheers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's bring on Carolyn. Tonight we have Carolyn Sherlock from the Boat Galley on. And uh, let's okay. just bring her on and all. Let's do it. All right. Be crazy. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Welcome. Are you? It, oh, wait. Uh, now I can't hear you. Are you muted? No, no, there's a little delay. Go ahead, Carolyn. Can you hear me now? I can. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I have, I have mine here, too. In the... The mis uh, mystery coffee cup. I like that. Absolutely. We are currently um, in a little Airbnb while taking care of some medical issues. So um, we have coffee mugs for everything. You drink your soup in a coffee mug, you drink your coffee, and you have your Friday afternoon happy hour in a coffee mug. Yeah, it was just kind of like a boat, right? Absolutely. Make do with what you have. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm still drinking out of that same juice container. And I see Jack is here. Hi, Jack. I'm drinking out of that same juice container. I was drinking on the last spin sheet happy hour a month ago, but I'm having a, a Mount Gay. I've got a little mango juice and mm. some um, uh, sparkling water because the mango juice is pretty heavy duty stuff. So, um, yes. but, um, you know, a little Friday afternoon Mount Gay here. What are you having, Jim? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm having a, a Mount Gay and ginger. Um, glad to have the ginger beer back um, so I can enjoy incredibly, it. Exactly. Incredibly boring. Coke and rum. Mount we... Gay, of course. <laughs> of course. There we go. Ching, ching. All right. Well, cheers. Happy Friday, sailors. Thanks for joining us for Spin Sheet Happy Hour. Yes. So um, we're going to be talking to Carolyn about some tips and tricks in an onboard galley. But um, anyone who's ever been to our website knows she's about a lot more than cooking, too. But we're going to start with cooking. Then we're going to see how sort of the questions about cruising and liveaboard sailing evolve. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. Well, you're gonna stick around. You gotta take care of your dog behind the scenes. I'm gonna go make sure the dog isn't barking. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Well, okay. we'll bring you. We'll bring you back. Oh, hi, Max. We'll bring you back at last call. And, okay. Uh, and feel free to chime in if you have any questions or comments, and uh, we know where to find you. Yes, I'll be around. All right. I'll be right back. Okay. Bye. Great. See you later, Sharb. Well, Carolyn, we um we we have a habit of starting at the very beginning with all of our guests because every single one of our guests is a sailor. And so we start like at the beginning. How did you get into sailing? Can you give us a little summary of your sailing experience and what brought you to where you are today? Of course. Um, when I was a kid, my folks had a summertime cabin where we literally lived from the day school was out to the day school started um, on this little lake up in Michigan and saw a lot of sailboats out on the lake all the time and everything. Um, and one day my mom happened to be at the little store and there was a sign for kids sailing classes. And she walks in from buying the newspaper and whatnot. And she says, I signed you up for sailing classes. Okay, sounds cool. Um, I was into basically anything related to the water. And so took it, fell in love with it. And that Christmas uh, got my first uh, sailboat, a little sunfish. After that, um, let's see. I, oh, yeah. Well, I ended up going to work in Indianapolis and literally did not know anyone in town and happened to see, as I was walking through the mall one day, um, a thing for the Indianapolis Sailing Club. And I was like, well, you know, I've got this little sailboat. I've always enjoyed sailing. Maybe I'll start meeting some people that, you know, I have something to do. I'll meet some people like-minded. Um, so I joined the sailing club. Um, they did racing, which I had done some racing on the little lake we'd been on before. And started, you know, just, it grew and grew. Um, ended up getting my own boat, uh, one of the Y Flyers, which is what they raced, one of the boats they raced there. Um, mm-hmm. Through the Y Flyers, met my husband, who was also racing against me. He always beat me, um, but um, he was pretty good. Um, we ended up crewing together and, you know, he was always laugh about people going off on charters and stuff. And then one year friends talked us into going with them. We went and chartered. We discovered we liked this big boat thing. We talked about it on and off for like eight or 10 years. And finally he said, you know, if we're ever gonna do this live on a boat and sail off into the sunset thing, we need to go ahead and do this. And within two months of that, we had bought a boat down in Mexico. And about three months later, we actually moved on to it and cruised for seven years. Wow. Went back and looked on land for seven years. And now we're eight years on this boat. So we're now in the Florida Keys, which is pretty nice. So I know this is this is bigger than a bite-sized uh, question, but... Maybe you can just give us an idea, you know, during that seven years when you were cruising, where were you cruising to? Were you doing sort of the East Coast down down to the Bahamas and back or what, what, would, what, were, your, what were your roots? On our, on our first boat, um, we bought the boat in Puerto Vallarta, which is on the Pacific coast of Mexico. Mm-hmm. And we went all through, spent several years basically based in the Sea of Cortez, um, Baja, California. We went as far south as El Salvador and decided that we know we really did enjoy Mexico that much. So we kind of went back up. Um, then we sold that boat to um, deal with, we just needed to be land-based for, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And yeah. after about seven years, it was like, we've taken care of everything we needed to, we loved it. Let's go buy a boat again. And with that one, we bought it down in South Florida on the Okeechobee waterway. Um, brought it down to the Florida Keys. The Keys are kind of where we're basing it now. Um, But we've made three different trips over to the Bahamas and up and down the east coast of Florida. We keep hoping that we're going to make it all the way up to the Chesapeake, but we haven't quite done it yet. Yeah. Um, But we've helped other friends going from the Chesapeake. So, yeah. Well, I know I I met you at a boat show at the Chesapeake. And that's, that's the first time I remember you know, seeing your name and meeting you. I think you came up to the spin sheet booth, which is how I met you. And then yeah. I know that you come to the Annapolis, uh, sail- are you coming to the Annapolis Spring Sailboat Show? 
not going to be at the spring show this year, but um, I have a booth with Lynn Party at the fall show every year. Yeah, yeah. And um, have you ever done any talks at uh, Cruisers University? Yes. Um, I teach, um, there's actually five courses and every year they pick four of them, but I do um, a comprehensive hurricane preparation, eating well with a tiny refrigerator, storage solutions when your boat is your home, the unwritten rules of cruising and, and, and there's something else. <laughs> <laughs> you teach a bunch of classes. How about that? Um, Let's talk about the cooking thing. Like, how did you start um, helping people with cooking on board? I mean, that's very daunting for some people. I know I've, I've done some cruising sailing and it was amazing to me, even the sailors who just assumed we had sandwiches and, you know, ate, ate like, you know, like racing sailors eat like that. They bring some sandwiches in a cooler and they scarf down with a, need to eat, but, you know, cruisers can eat really well. And, um, but, you know, if you haven't done it before, you don't know that. So I'm just wondering how, how you started going down that path. Well, it started out because my husband, well, actually, even I, as a kid, um, through scouts and everything else, did a lot of camping. Um, and then my husband and I did a lot of tent camping. Well, by comparison, this galley on the boat was luxurious. We had everything we could possibly want. We had a stove, we had a refrigerator. Our first boat even had a microwave on it. I mean, we could, you know, we had a grill outside. Um, but that background with the camping really did me a lot of good because I was used to doing things in almost non-existent space, knew about having almost no refrigeration, things like that. And also feeding people who were physically working. Um, so you get hungry. And what I kept finding was that, you know, as I'd be standing in line at a potluck or something and talking to people around me, they would have a bunch of questions. They'd be asking like, well, how did you make that? How did you do this? How did you do that? So I'd start answering and then more and more people would start asking me things and realized hmm, this seems to be something that people want to know about. And Actually, it was after we were through with the first the first lap of cruising, um, a friend of mine who's also a cruiser, Jan Irons, said, you know, you and I have both been collecting a lot of this information about cooking on a boat, and neither one of us has really found a cooking on a boat cookbook that, that truly we love. She's like, let's write one. And so that started us writing the Boat Galley Cookbook. Um, and in the meantime, I sort of, I put together this little website. I was going to put up maybe 20 posts or something about various little tips about cooking on a boat. Well, best like plans, there's 1,300 and some articles now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's, that's how we ended up getting into it. And I love helping people and helping figure out what can work. And then as time went on, we started talking about all aspects of cruising. Yeah. And again, I think when you say we, are you still, are you still working in partnership with your original partner you wrote the cookbook with? Well, she and I are still really good friends, but no, we basically just did the cookbook together. And for several years, I was doing everything by myself. And now I have five other people who helped me on the boat galley. Um, some of them are totally behind the scenes, like my virtual assistant. Um, we have a graphics designer now, but then I have Nika Waters that I do the podcast with. I think she's been on your happy hour. She has been on our happy hour. We were talking about, um, um, you know, uh, the steps you take to move aboard to take off for cruising. And she, I, I think was, I was trying, I was trying to ask for myself if her husband was on. I, she might've just been on solo, but she did show pictures of the whole family. So we know that they cruised as a family and they're now, cruising as a couple and yeah she was right. a great guest so that's a that's a good person to have working with you and another one is john hurlick who's one of your columnists yes and one of our star columnists he's a wonderful guy and then um i also have a guy named larry weber who's been up and down the east coast numerous times mm -hmm. and he's been working with us on like our icw guide our florida loop guide and hopefully we're soon going to be coming out with a bahamas guide 
Great. So, um, so say I, I just bought a boat or I'm thinking about buying a boat and, and I'm really new to cooking on board. Do you have sort of, uh, you know, some of the essentials that you need to have in a galley or some favorite, favorite things you like to have in the galley? Yes. The first thing that I really like for galley use is um, Madden makes a very good set of nesting hands. And they take up so much less space than any other set of hands. You can use them as serving bowls as well, and you can bake in them because they have detachable handles and so forth. Um, that's probably my number one thing that I love in the galley. And what, what was the name of that brand again? Magma, M-A-G-M-A. -A. They oh, also Magma. make okay. grills and so forth outdoors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, their, grills, their grills are quite good for boats also. Um, a grill for a boat is really different than just a gas grill for home. And while some of us are very tempted to toss the cheaper, get the cheaper home grills on, they really do make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, other things that I love are a good thermos. I think I have like three of them. One's my coffee one. One's a, lar a fairly large one that I can put soup and so forth in, but doesn't have that whole taste of coffee in it. And then I have a small one where I make yogurt and keep small amounts of things in. Um, that's another one that I had never really had while living on land. I never used a thermos that much, and I was shocked at how many times I used it and that I actually wanted three of them, not just one. Um, <laughs> other things, um, pretty much the big workhorse in my galley is a lot of, I call them lock and lock containers, but that's really only one brand. But any of the um, um, storage containers that have a, a latching lid that also has a gasket around it, it keeps the moisture out and any bugs out. And those are huge for almost everything that you're trying to store, whether it's like flour, sugar, pasta, um, pancake mix, anything that you might be thinking of. That really goes a long ways. Um, just, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, we had some noise behind us. Um, and that's the other big workhorse that I go through. Outside of that, a lot of it is the same stuff that you use at home. You want things that won't rust. So high quality stainless steel. Um, I use silicone scrapers and that kind of thing. I use very good quality um, plastic bowls and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like single use plastics, but for some of the things that you'll be using over and over, like a good mixing bowl and so forth, having things that won't break and that don't clank and make noise go a long ways. Um, I do go ahead and right now I'm in this Airbnb, so all I've got is my mug, but on the boat, I actually have glass wine glasses and things like that. I just have ones that are somewhat thicker, so they're mm -hmm. not as likely to break. Mm -hmm. um, and we're careful with them. Um, they always get stowed away before we get underway, or if it looks like there's a squall coming or something, they get tucked into some secure places. Well, before we take a question from the audience, I'm going to ask a question that just came to me. So I, I, it, it's a surprise question for you, Carolyn, but I know you have an answer right off the top of your head. Tell me about knives, because as a cook in the kitchen, you know, in my home kitchen, I have a whole variety of knives and I never worry about any of those knives flying across my kitchen <laughs> for any reason. So I wonder sort of how many knives you have and storage tips for those knives so as not to, you know, accidentally knife somebody on the boat on rough seas or whatnot. Right. Um, I have a um, basically a like a French chef knife, like an eight inch blade. It's a nice one. I have a bread knife because I'm into making homemade bread and it's wonderful. Um, I have a paring knife. I have a meat carving knife and that's really all I have. And they are all, they're stainless blades, but they are ones that can be sharpened. Having a regular steel blade um, does end up having some problems with rust and so forth. Most people end up being a little happier with a stainless blade, even though you can't sharpen it quite as sharp. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I use a lot is a pair of good kitchen shears. 
Um, I'm currently on a cam grant, so having knives going places isn't as big of a problem, yeah. but it still is. When I was on a monohull, it was really a problem. And in both cases, what I have is for when we're at anchor and so forth, I have a um, knife block that actually um, isn't as much a block as, as a um, universal sizing. It's just got these little little prongs that I'll stand up and stick them down in there. Mm -hmm. um, they hold them quite securely. But the minute that we're getting underway or where it looks like a, a serious squall is coming or something, they all get put into a drawer. Um, I just wrap them in a towel and so right. that the blades aren't scratching out one another, set them in there and that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm cooking it all underway or anything, the knives all get set down into the sink when I'm not actually holding and using one. You know, like we normally put it down on the counter, put it down in the sink and it really, really minimizes the chances of them going fly. Mm -hmm. And if it's yeah. not rough, if it's super, super rough, you're not going to be using the knife anyway. So, I mean, yeah, your yeah. hand's going to get sliced. Yeah, I've used the sink trip for, for, for a number of things. Um, we yeah. have two good questions from someone in the audience here. So why don't we just launch into them before we sure. get to my other questions? So Sarah Cole. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming. Welcome. What's your favorite kitchen tool? How about if I name maybe three of them? Um, first okay. thing, it's like we were just talking about. Second is I have a um, silicone, they call it a spoon spatula. It works well for mixing a lot of stuff and it is also my scraper and so forth. And then I have what's called a Danish dough whisk. And I wish I was really on the boat and I could hold it up, but it's designed for mixing heavy batters, um, things like bread dough, brownie mix, anything like that. It's gonna be heavy and you're having to mix by hand because I don't have an electric beater. Um, it's not this thin little wire whisk that you're used to, you know, whisking eggs and so forth with. Um, it's like a, a very heavy wire that just goes up in this big loop and around and a good sturdy handle on it. And I actually use that more often than I use a spoon for mixing things. Uh huh. Great. Sarah's other question, do you use electric or manual appliances? Do you think about how much electricity your tools use and plan for it when you're managing your batteries? Batteries, we're all obsessed with batteries on boats, aren't we? Aren't we though? Um, yes, I use almost all manual, um, but on both boats, we do have some electric. Um, for a long time, I used a little electric coffee grinder. Um, I had a microwave on the first boat. I don't now, mainly because of room, not because of power requirements. And I do think a little bit about the electricity. As I said, space is actually tending to be a bigger problem for me than power. Um, we have some lithium batteries, not a huge bank, but we do have 300 amp hours worth. And we have a fair amount of solar, solar panel power. And we almost daily fill back up with solar, if not every day, probably every two days. You know, if we get a cloudy day and then we might have a day where we're a little bit down. Um, Consequently, it's not as big of a problem for us as when we began cruising in 2002. We didn't have we didn't have nearly as good a battery technology then, and we didn't have nearly as high efficient um, solar panels then. We had as technically it had as much wattage, but it had far bigger problems with shading and things like that. So we do a lot better now with what we can. I like Jack's question. Go ahead and pop it up there. Best and favorite ways to make a coffee. Now, this is even a debate on land. So, Jack, awesome question. Thank you. And just so you know, Carolyn, Jack is a regular at the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. I don't know if he does any cruising or not. He does a ton of racing. He's a Spin Sheet Racing team member, but he is a regular at the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. So, thanks for coming, Jack. There are, there are actually several different good ways to make coffee on a boat. Um, what I actually do is I have um, a good size thermos and I use one of the um, old fashioned um, Melita cone. Um, basically it's like a funnel kind of that goes down into it. You put a, you put a uh, uh, 
filter into it in the coffee. It's basically a drip coffee maker, like your Mr. Coffee, except it's a little bit more manual. Um, a lot of people um, really like um, various forms of a French press, or there's one called an American press. Um, that's a good one. And there's an, another one called an Aero press that a lot of people use. Those are all good ones. Um, one of the things that I try to always be thinking about um, is trying not to have something that stands too tall up on my counter because it gets tippier. And I actually make my coffee down into the sink. Um, both so the coffee, that's not gonna be as much of a problem. And that way also, as I'm pouring the boiling water, should any of the water spill, it'll go down in. Mm -hmm. I do know people that use like the good old Mr. Coffee and so forth right on the boat. I have some friends that use a Keurig. Um, if you use a Keurig, um, please use refillable pods and don't have all yeah. that plastic waste going everywhere. But um, pretty much you can do anything that you want as long as you plan for it. Um, I like having less glass with that glass coffee pot. That's one of my reasons. And, and actually here in this Airbnb, they've got a like, nice little Mr. Coffee. I realized one other advantage of just making my coffee into a thermos all the time. I've got a good thermos, so it stays hot. But the coffee never gets that burnt taste and so forth by, because it's been sitting on the burner for hours. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just been sitting in the thermos, so it's not constantly being heated. And it's actually better coffee. So being on the boat and pouring your coffee into a big thermos isn't really the bad thing that it may initially seem like. Yeah. Well, I see that um, longtime spin sheet columnist Cindy Wallach just chimed in that uh, she likes her AeroPress. And uh, I know even on land, I, I'm, I'm a French press girl myself, but even on land, I, I use a stainless steel French press because I've broken so many of the glass ones over the years. But I admit it's a little tall for a boat. It's a little, it's a little tippy. Um, I, I ended up in a blizzard in California at Christmas time. And it just so happens that someone had given my brother a thermos slash French press, and it saved us during this blizzard because we had no electricity for days, but we had very good coffee. So um, yeah. it, it would also work very well on a boat. We were um, we, we spent a lot of time talking about coffee at that time. So anyway, love that question. For anyone who's just, and, and the people come in and out of the program, for anyone who's just chiming in, we're talking to Carolyn Sherlock of the Boat Gallery, and she's giving us some tips and tricks from um, the galley on a boat for anyone who's kind of new to cooking on a boat or who just likes tips about cooking. Um, the, uh, let's see, let's, um, let's just talk about cooking in general. Um, you know, how Oh, now that was my house. Sorry about that. that, that <laughs> the dryer is done in case anybody was worried. Uh, um, so, um, how does cooking underway differ from cooking on land? Um, and, and how does, uh, you know, cooking while dock, then you have cooking on a mooring, you have cooking while underway, maybe just sort of talk about the different versions of cooking on a boat. Well, basically what we've been talking about with making coffee and, you know, thinking about the height of it and whether it's going to be tipping, that's one of the really big ones. And another one that I'm always looking at is whether something is going to slide on the counter as the boat is moving. And overall, it's not as big of a problem when you're at a dock, but it can still all happen. I have had it where we've been at a nice 15 degree heel at the dock because of winds just blowing that hard. So even then you may be thinking about it, obviously underway, you're gonna have the most motion of all. And we tend when we're underway I do a lot of prep work ahead of time. I make meals ahead of time, but also we do far more snacking underway. And I don't mean snacking like the potato chips and you know junk food kind of snacking, but we'll do stuff like just basically finger food, like some carrots, some celery, some olives, some nuts. Um, those kinds of things where we can just grab it when it's convenient and go. and. We'll maybe have one real meal every day and the rest of the time will be things that are easy to grab and go. I'll also do things like 
make up a big bowl um, of pasta salad because we we've always cruised pretty much in warmer climates. So we're looking for cold foods, but you can do the same thing um, in cooler climates, like make up a big pot of soup, pour it into your thermos or thermal cooker and keep it hot and just got it. All you have to do is serve it up. And once again, your all purpose coffee mug. Um, I actually have a couple of thermos ones on the boat but they work really well, not only for your coffee, but for your soups and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing is when you're doing things like um, cutting and slicing, um, being very careful, I try to sit down when I can for jobs like that. If I can't sit, I actually brace myself. I'm finding myself doing this as I'm sitting here talking. I'm, I'm putting my foot on the floor to brace myself. Um, but I put my feet out against a cupboard or something like that where I'm really kind of braced so that if I get a little bumped and so forth I'm not going to go falling I'm not going to take that knife and take it into me and more importantly I'm not going to fall into a lit burner on the stove that's probably falling into a lit burner is probably my number one concern and having a big pot of something that is hot come and flip towards me is my second worry. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always trying to plan my moves out so that neither one of those happens. Mm -hmm. We have the, um, we have a question from Mary Hauser. Let's go ahead and pop that one up. Would love to know what your best galley fridge storage tips are. Oh, that can be a frustrating place, the fridge, right? Depends on the shape of it but uh, a little yeah. less frustrating on a catamaran than the kind where you have to go down into it. <laughs> That's going to be my, my first comment is it's so much depends on whether you've got a top loading or a front loading. Mm -hmm. And with a top loading, I've had, I've had one of each on, on our two boats. Top loading, what I ended up doing was having a large number of bins and having them stacked in there so that I could just pull out a whole bin um, and quickly get to what I needed. It, it only took about a week before I realized what order I was stacking things in and, and I would always know where things are. The bottom is gonna be very coldest. So you put things like your drinks there, your lunch meats, your butter. And as you come up, you know, cheese meat doesn't need to be as, as cold. So it kind of can go in the middle and so forth. Produce generally you want on top because you don't want it getting super cold, just want it cool. And, that all works. Um, and so I think if you're looking at a top loader, the number one thing that I can say is use a lot of bins and other dividers. And when I say bins, I mean, I had things like some small um, um, <clears throat> waste baskets that I cut some air holes into so they could have airflow through. But I mean, there weren't true bins because I couldn't find a bin that was the right size, but ooh, this looks perfect. Um, so did that. And the uh, second item on that is just realizing that with that top loading, that the coldest section um, is going to be at the bottom and getting progressively warm as you come up and planning your foods accordingly. Um, on my website, there's actually quite a few articles dealing with that. So um, I know Chris has got the website coming up, but it's theboatgalley.com, that's real hard. Um, and then just in the search box, type refrigerator, you'll know, find a whole lot of stuff. For the front loaders, and I thought that I was going to like having a front loader better than a top loader. Seven years with each, I actually think I like the top loaders better because the cold stays in when you open the top of it. You, every time that you open the door on that front loader, all this beautiful cold air just falls out and it is filled right back up again with warm, humid air, which means that I am defrosting that refrigerator every two weeks. And the temperature inside fluctuates more. So I have to be a little bit more careful about like keeping my meats in the freezer and things like that so that I don't have to worry about them. Um, and again, the other one that I would say for either type um, as far as a big tip, is basically having designated locations for everything. So that when you open the refrigerator, you either know that you're getting into 
you know, in a top loader, the second bin down, that's going to have what I need. Or in the front loader, I know that what I want is at the back right corner on the top shelf, totally saving you time of having that refrigerator open, um, both for keeping the temperature reasonably level, but also, as we talked about earlier, with how much you're drawing down the batteries because they've got to, of course, cool everything back off and more hot air that you've let in. Yeah. We have some nice comments from the audience on tips that they do. Brian Gorell says he, in their top loader, they use shower caddies. Perfect. Yeah. That, I've never thought about that, but yeah, that, that would be exactly a great one. Yeah. Yeah. And Beth Domesco commented that um, she puts bins in the fridge and she has hers labeled. So thank you. Thank you, Brian and Beth, both of you for your comments. These, uh, these are helpful. We have another question here from, um, from Sarah Cole, which I think is a really good one that I never thought about. How do you manage compost? We weekend cruisers don't have think have to think about that as much as uh, people who are long term cruisers. So, well, I'll I'll ask you a question. Maybe you can hopefully pop pop your answer right back up. There's two sorts of compost that I have to deal with. One is what I might call my food scraps on board, and the other is we have a composting toilet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to deal with that one too. If you're talking about food scraps sort of thing, um, what I do is basically I repurpose things that would otherwise be going into the trash. So if I have a jar or something, um, jars are my favorite because you just open them up, stick food, food scraps in there, my potato peels, you know, tomato cores, whatever you've got, and put the lid back on so it doesn't stink. That works really well. Um, if you're particularly in a humid and hot place if before you start using it just put a squirt of bug spray into it first that helps considerably with the little flying insects that we all love yeah, yeah. um and um then from there they go um it goes ashore and into um whatever local trash there is i have never yet found a marina that actually has a compost bin I couple friends have told me that they have found a couple in like worldwide cruising. I think one found one in California and one found one in Australia. But the reality is it doesn't, it's not really an option in those places. Um, some people I know do throw food scraps into the water. I've been on too many beaches that had too many scraps that had washed up. I am just not going to do that because First of all, fish do not naturally eat human food um, scraps, so it throws their ecosystem off. Um, if they do start eating with it, it can actually act as poison for some things. And secondly, um, it, it, so many things will float. I mean, um, potato, peel, potato peels frequently will float, banana peels definitely, orange peels hugely. It's, it's ugly. I mean, why, why do it? Mm -hmm. And if you have a composting pad, well, like we do, that just goes into the trash bin too. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, it's legal. It's legal. Regardless of what the city of Annapolis says, I swear to God, it's the same law that says you can put baby diapers into the trash. It's legal. <laughs> so you, you've given us quite a few tips about like preparing food and cooking while underway. Do you have any favorite tips or common tips that you give to people cooking on board that we haven't touched on here? Can you think of any? I think the first thing that I tell people when you first start out, and it's exactly the opposite of what I did and how I learned that what I did was <laughs> the wrong thing. Start simply. Um, you know, your first meals, I at least, and my first meals underway, I've I, we decided that we were going to have a big steak dinner with homemade bread and a toss salad and everything else to celebrate our first night of doing an overnight passage. What in the world was I thinking? I mean, we're still trying to figure out what we're doing with the boat sailing, sailing overnight. It's getting dark. We need to do that. No, plan simple, simple things at first and then progressively get more advanced in what you're doing. Try things out first at the dock or at anchor before you're gonna do them underway. Mm -hmm. um, and remember that any meal is gonna be incredibly enhanced by the view that you have on the water and that gorgeous sunset for dinner 
or sunrise in the morning. And the food itself doesn't have to be super complicated to have everybody going, wow, I loved it. Yeah. And isn't there just something about being on a boat that makes you feel, I don't know, maybe it's like being a little kid or something like I'm eating spaghetti on a boat <laughs> and it makes it better, you know, just because you're on a boat. And a bologna sandwich on a boat is a wonderful meal. Bologna sandwich on land? Eh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's exciting to cook on a boat, I think. Do you have any um, any favorite uh, recipes that you can share? Maybe some of the simple ones that you could share. Uh, I know you have a bunch on your website, so maybe you could just give us recipe resources. But if you have something off the top of your head, uh, you know, that might sure, be. Sure. It, it's, you've been seeing the crawl. It's gone along with the website. So, yeah, there's a, there's a whole list. Of, the, the menu will take you to that with about 100 different recipes. And the cookbook has 800. But um Wow. Some of the favorites that we do and do frequently um, are things like uh, instead of just instead of a regular uh, grilled hamburger, um, I've got a recipe for what we call gyro burgers. It's, it's hard, particularly when you're off like in Mexico, you, you can't go to the corner pub and get a gyro. They don't make them there. They make wonderful tacos, but not gyros. Um, so it. It's much easier. You don't have the big spit and so forth, but it tastes very much like what you would get at your favorite Greek restaurant. So things like that I really enjoy. And that's basically it's um, ground turkey. It's actually even better than ground beef. A um, bunch of garlic, oregano, um, and a little bit of feta cheese mixed in. Mm. Put, it on, put it on the grill. Mix, it, mix up some tzatziki, which is your yogurt and some mint and so forth, put it all together and on a bun or in a wrap and you've got a great meal. Um, wraps I really like because stuff doesn't fall out of them quite as much while you're in the middle of moving back and forth on the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our other favorite things. Um, well, our current one has been popcorn. Um, I had always figured that making popcorn in just a plain pan on the stove was horrifically difficult and prone to burning. And when I actually decided to try it one day, I discovered it was a lot easier than I thought it was. And I really could do it. And I didn't have to have a popcorn maker um, or a microwave to do it. Um, other things that we really like are like a, we have a chicken breast with um, a bruschetta sauce, um, bruschetta, mm. really cool sauce, I guess, with bruschetta. Um, but basically the chopped up tomatoes, a little bit of bals balsamic vinegar, uh, some spices, your, your garlic and your basil and so forth. Very simple meal. You know, all you have to do is, is marinate the chicken breast for like 15 minutes before and then toss them on the grill. It's ready in 10 to 15 minutes. I'm a big one on fast cooking. I also, the other thing that I do is use what's called a thermal cooker. It's basically like a crock pot, but it's for boaters and you don't actually need electricity. You start it cooking on the stove and then put the pan into what's like a, a giant thermos um, and with a with an insulated lid as well. And it will continue to cook on its own, but it doesn't really overcook. So if we're going to go to happy hour, I'll do the cooking in the morning, leave everything in my thermal cooker all day. Then when I come home from happy hour or like tonight we have happy hour all i have to do is just open it up do whatever last minute things have to be done it serve it and i've got a dinner i'm not starting to cook dinner when i come back from the happy hour the hike through the to the waterfall the snorkeling trip whatever we've decided to go do i get to cook at the time that's convenient for me and that's another one of the big things that it's been a game changer as far as I was concerned to be able to shift my cooking pan. Do you know to, what brand the thermal cooker is or if there are a couple different brands? Or? There are several of them. Um, I, the one that I use that I think is a really good value for the money is made by Saratoga Jacks and it's available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, if you go to the website and just go thermal cooker, you'll get reviews on two or three different ones of them, but the Saratoga Jacks is probably my favorite 
simply mm -hmm. because the value of it for the money and it's also a really good size one for two or three people. Um, some of the bigger ones, plainly and simply, if you have a small, smaller amount of food for only a couple people, you've got a lot of air in there, so it doesn't do as good job a good a job of keeping it all hot because mm -hmm. there is a fair amount of air that you're trying to keep hot in there too. So, think, figuring out the size that you need is really important when you get something like that. Yeah, but well, this also sounds like a good thing for, you know, single people who work behind a desk all day and come up to <laughs> that sounds like something maybe I need to look into. Um, the smaller ones works really well. I, yeah. I have several friends that single hand and we found some smaller sized ones that worked well for them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Karen Sewell is on here she, and she's put up two tips that I think are worth sharing. And uh, thanks for joining us, Karen. Plastic wine crates from the container store allow us to store canned drinks and stuff vertically. Two cans equals one bottle of wine. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's yeah. a good tip right there just for storage. And she said she used prepackaged cooked and pulled rotisserie chicken from Costco and lots of recipes. That is a good fallback. Yeah, that's yeah. a thanks. Those are good shortcuts right there. Um Carolyn, on your website, you said you have 1,500 recipes? No, no, I have about 1,300 articles, but there's only about 100 recipes. Okay, and you have 800 in your cookbook. 1,400 are about um, various things relating to living on a boat. Yeah, and where, where, do, where do you go to seek out new recipes? Um, oh, boy, I have a lot of them. Um, First of all, I have several friends that I just, we just swap recipes back and forth. And a lot of the recipes that we swap are sort of like, um, well, I sauteed it up and added a bunch of garlic. Yeah. <laughs> real, real specific. Um, one that I really like, um, websites I like are um, A Taste of Home, Cooking Light. I am diabetic now, so I have a diabetic group. Um, type two, it's called uh, Diabetes Type 2 Straight Talk. Uh, they have a really good section on very low carb eating. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing now is, is very low carb. Mm -hmm. So I don't go to mass, mass places as much, but it tends to be a lot of websites. Um, yeah. Well, good, That's a, that, that answers my question. And uh, I see that Ron Chizinski has a question too. Do you need or invite guests <laughs> for to cook? Well, geez. You fly solo in the kitchen. How does that work? Um, when we have guests and so forth, um, usually it depends on who it is and, and how well I know them and so forth. But our galley in both boats has been tiny. It really only fits one person. So I tend to do typically um, either a, like when Jan was a, my cookbook co-author, when she was on board our boat for a week, um, we swapped off who was cooking various nights and the other one would do the dishes and the guys would do whatever grilling was going to be done. Um, things like that. What I find is um, a lot of people who do not live on a boat themselves don't quite understand both the power restrictions that we have. Right now, I only have two burners on my stove. That absolutely freaks out an awful lot of people of, what do you do? And I'm sort of like, well, you know, you, you stick whatever you need to stay warm kind of in between the burners towards the back. That doesn't work. But they also don't always realize how to limit their water usage um, and like pouring rinse water over dishes and so forth so they, they're getting rent they're getting rinsed um by whatever you're pouring off say your pasta and things like that mm -hmm. so straight up this like when we've had um, relatives that aren't voters themselves come i don't usually have them cook or wash dishes as much i'm like no go ahead sit on deck with your glass of wine and i'll just take care of it yeah yeah <laughs> So, um, 
Can you tell us a little, you know, I know you have lots of other things going on in your, in the boat galley besides just cooking tips. Can you give us a bit like a, a broader view of, of what you do these days? And that can be from your teaching to your publications to anything else that we haven't touched upon here since we've been focused on the cooking aspect. Sure. Um, the website does have basically tips and information about all aspects. Um, I don't actually teach sailing or boating, so I'm not teaching rules of the road and things like that, but I do give some safety tips and so forth. But we go into, say, electrical things, like we've talked about electrical systems, um, talking about different types of batteries, charging systems, pros and cons, water makers, all of that type of information. Talk about tips for living on board, like how many pair of shoes do you really need? What sort of clothes really work? All of that is on the website. And then Mika, that was on here before, she and I do a podcast. We now have over 500 episodes of that out, which are on exactly the same types of topics, except that you can listen to them while you're driving, while you're walking, um, if you're in the gym and working out. They're pretty short. They're typically five to 15 minutes long. So you can do them while you're running to the grocery store or whatever. Um, or we have some people that just binge listen all the way to the boat show. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, and then I have two official books out, the cookbook, Boat Galley Cookbook, and Storing Food Without Refrigeration. But in the last couple of years, we've brought out a whole another group of products um, with the ICW cockpit guide. Um, I actually have one of those right here. Yeah. Should I get it there? Um, and what these are is, unlike the big heavy uh, cruising guides, these are by topic, like this here, I don't know how much you can see, is anchorages and then literally mile by mile. So you can say, geez, I'm passing up an anchorage. Am I going to find another one in an hour or so from now? Or should I go ahead and stop here? I need fuel. Am I going to find it in an hour? Um, we've got two of those types of cockpit guides out. We've got um, the boat documents folder. We've got a ship's log. Um, we've got a VHF handy reference so that basically when you're sitting there and going, oh, geez, I don't remember that spelling alphabet. I don't remember how I'm supposed to call to talk to this big ship that's coming my way. What am I supposed to do? Because I know they don't talk on the same channels we do. Um, all of that sort of thing and all those we're selling on Amazon. And then we've taken all the courses that um, both John and I teach at Cruisers University, expanded them, and we now teach them as online courses now. Um, but they're not the typical video where you have to show up at a given time. We teach, they're all on demand. You can go through them at your own pace, at your own time. If you like to do things at three in the morning, that's fine, you can. You'll be able to have all the updates and everything as many years. Like right now we've been dealing with Literally, about every two weeks, we're changing the information on what the Bahamas COVID requirements are. Yeah. Um, and so they, it just, we keep updating. And if, even if you got it three years ago, you get the current information um, mm -hmm. if you go and check on it. So those are the types of things that we're into right now. Um, well, we, uh, I'd be happy to take a final question from the audience, but I have a final question and I just want to ask, what's next? What's next in your future? When are we going to see you again? What are you teaching? Any new books coming out? What should we know about? What's next? Several things. Um, we Our next um, little cockpit guide that we call the cockpit guide, but really is sort of a mini cruising guide is going to be coming out about the Bahamas. And we should have that out in time for uh, next fall season of people going to the Bahamas, probably coming out, say, in August to September time frame because people start going about October. Mm -hmm. um, that's coming out. Um, I'm going to be at the fall Annapolis Boat Show. We've really expanded our booth there. We've got a double booth now okay. and having a good time with that. I'll be teaching um, four of my courses, but I don't know which four yet at Cruisers University. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, um, Dave and I are going to be cruising around uh, Southern Florida uh, this summer and early fall. Mm -hmm. So, but we're all, uh, wherever I am, I mean, this is the really nice thing about doing this. As long as I've got an internet connection, which is almost anywhere now, 
I'm in contact. So people don't really have to worry about where I'm actually sitting. Yeah. They can ask questions and do things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, uh, I'm, I, it's been a true pleasure to have you here. And it's been so nice to have an active um, audience, you know, telling, giving us their tips on their, their galleys and their, uh, their tips and tricks and you no know, coffee, of course, the coffee conversation continues. And, yes. um, but that's really important. So, um, Sharb, where are you? Are you gonna I'm right here. Your, you're back. Is your job leaving himself? Of course. Of course he is. Yeah. Can well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't bust your chops when Carolyn was talking about, um, Carolyn was talking about sending the guys outside to grill. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> When I tried to kill everybody by feeding them raw chicken. Our, our group of friends went to the Bahamas <laughs> together on a big catamaran charter and uh, Sharb was in charge of the chicken. And uh, we maybe waited, a, a, we had kind of an extensive happy hour and maybe waited a little too long for grilling. It was kind of dark. <laughs> But there were a is. lot of excuses for that. We all we all had some raw chicken there. So anytime he's always cooking chicken, we are like, um oh. Yeah. And some of you deserve food poisoning. So <laughs> he needs parental guidance for the cooking. That's what we call anything black. And we say, no, it was intentional. It's Cajun. It's blackened. <laughs> <laughs> Better than raw. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Carolyn, I wanted to ask, do you have any secret behind French press coffee? There's a lot of like the procedure to actually create. I, good... am, I have used a French press a few times in my life, not as many, but Molly's saying that she does it a lot. So I bet she's the one that can tell you the secrets of it. Or if you ever happen to get hold of her, like I know that's what he does too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I sense a future column coming on. I don't know if John's watching. Yes. It. But when uh, when Carolyn, for anyone who just joined us for for Car when Carolyn was talking before about John doing online courses, she meant John Hurley, who's a, a spinchy columnist and uh, an excellent one at that. I hope you'll go read his column this month in the uh, in the March issue of Spinchy, which is out on the streets. But Carolyn, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining yes. us. It's been a real pleasure catching up with you, and we miss each other at the Annapolis Boat Show because you were so busy talking to customers every time I came by. So. Maybe next time we'll just have to, I'll have to come by super early in the morning or come by like at the end of Monday or something when uh, when things have calmed down a little bit. But uh. thank you so much for having me on. And I look forward to seeing you next October. And, you know, maybe we'll plan for like, maybe get together for a breakfast or something. And that sounds like coffee somewhere. That sounds like, like that. a great idea. <laughs> and uh, so everyone go check out the book And uh, yeah. And I wish you all a happy, safe weekend. And uh, we'll let Sharb close off the program because I know he has things to talk about. So uh. Okay. Let me, well, actually, I'll leave you guys on. I just got to do two things. One, uh, thank you very much to Mount Gay for obviously sponsoring this episode of the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. And last but not least, um, if you haven't already heard, um, the Spin Sheet crew parties are on. They are back after a long time. Last one we had, last ones we had were 2019. Um, and there are three. Not many people know that. Uh, there's one down in Hampton, Virginia. There's one in Solomon's and there's one in Annapolis. And if you intend any one of those, you will either see me, Molly, or the both of us. Or both of us. Yeah. In the find all the information at spinsheet.com. It's right on our homepage, the crew party information. Of course, it's on yeah. a March issue too. And, and no uh, need to register or do anything like that. Just Go to the crew finder, actually, and if you own a boat and you're looking for crew, you can fill out a profile about your boat. And exactly the opposite, if you are a person that doesn't own a boat but wants to get on, fill out a profile. We'll get you on a boat. So I hope to see you at one of those crew parties. Go to spinsheet.com to find out the dates uh, of each one of those and the times. But that's very exciting, and uh, I hope to see you there. So, again, thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll see you again at the next Spin Sheet Happy Hour. Have a great week.